Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, we're highlighting women in the arts, surrealism and blood-sucking demons. A Turkish art institute has been empowering women for more than seven decades. From Dracula to Buffy, an exhibition resurrects some of film's iconic vampires. And we explore the surrealist relationship between Salvador Dali and Rene Magritte. But first, the New York Museum of Modern Art has reopened its doors after a $450 million revamp. The upgrade boasts several new exhibition spaces, a performance studio and a creativity lab, doubling the space for the museum to exhibit its collections. Designers kept in mind MoMA's first director, Alfred Barr, who envisioned the museum as a giant laboratory, with the public partaking in a never-ending art viewing experiment. For more on this, let's turn to culture writer Dale Burning Sauer. Hi, Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. So, of course, Good. doubling the thank space is a huge thing for an institution like MoMA. Yeah. But from what I've read, I think the most interesting change is how uh, the audience is supposed to experience the display. Do you agree with that? No, I mean, the changes are much um, more broad than that. So the exhibition galleries previously were always organized by medium. Painting and sculpture and all the other mediums were all separated out. And, and then the way the exhibition galleries were organized was extremely linear. So you had a very confident, defined set of isms, you know, express, um, cubism, and then it, it all kind of, it was a, a linear, history, whereas now the way it's organized is much more open-ended. Um, it's organized by constellation. It's still chronological, mm -hmm. but they've allowed for a whole lot more space so that different stories can be told as opposed to the only story of modernism. So would you call it a laboratory for artistic experimentation as it was envisioned in the first place? Um, usually a museum permanent collection is quite staid. It doesn't change too much, especially if their take on history is that ours is a, the author, authoritative voice. Whereas now they're thinking much more in terms of constantly changing what they say. So every six months, what you will see in the permanent collection galleries will change by 30% roughly, which mm -hmm. means that each time you go, you will see a slightly different story. I mean, this uh, whole new idea of displaying artworks, of course, we're familiar to that style from um, digital yes. browsing and, uh, and our internet behaviours. But on another note, on the other yes. hand, do you think it would be a bit too tiring? It's, it's not too jarring. They've said, Anne Temkin said she didn't want a jumble sale. She wanted something coherent and elegant, I suppose, is the right way to put it. So. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. The first two galleries, um, they show the beginning of the story of modernism and painting and sculpture are there, but so is ceramics. And then you have film and uh, photography, but the film and photography is in an adjacent room. So um, it's not all too mixed up to um, be discombobulating. So Del, I mean, let's talk about why MoMA wanted yeah. to do this uh, revamp now. I mean, obviously museums all around the world are criticized for not being able to adapt to the new millennium and being stuck in the uh, last century, the century of like grand narratives and isms and all that. So obviously people see yeah. it as uh, MoMA's attempt to step out of the 20th century. Do you think MoMA will lead as an example in this? I think so. I mean, f f the, uh, well, f primarily because MoMA has the greatest collection of modern and contemporary art. So um, their authority is kind of uh, a given. And so for them to do something is crucial and they recognize it as such. Mm -hmm. And do you think, I mean, do we have a better MoMA now, now that all these changes are made? 
I absolutely think so. It was so exciting walking around the galleries. You see works that you know very well, and then you see a whole bunch that you just didn't know existed and that the curators didn't know they had. And I think that's the most exciting thing for me. They have this treasure trove. When an artist is um, acquired by a MoMA, uh, what many artists might not realize is that their work until now might never have been shown because it was a work that didn't fit into the very rigid structures they had in their galleries or it was a work that didn't have the right kind of space. They've got a new, um, not only new galleries, but they've got new kinds of galleries. So in particular, there's one called the studio, the Kravis studio, which um, on the timeline is at about the 60s and 70s when artists start experimenting with multimedia. And this gallery will enable them to show sound works, live art, performance, very crucial mediums to today, to the way artists work today, in a way that the museum simply couldn't beforehand. That means then that all these works that they've bought over the years have a chance to be shown properly in a way that they haven't been either. Wouldn't it be nice if they maybe yeah. moved some bits to, I don't know, say Queens or Brooklyn? It would be a bolder move for rebirth, and also I think it would definitely alter the cultural atmosphere in the city, wouldn't it? Well, so Glenn R Lowry, the, um, the director of the museum, has said that he doesn't want to see more MoMAs. He can only imagine one MoMA. So it's not a case of like the, the Louvre um, multiplying its venues. He doesn't imagine MoMA being able to do that. And I think I agree with that. I mean, moving, to a, moving would actually therefore mean abandoning Manhattan entirely and only being in Queens or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I think they have to balance many things. You know, you have people who really know about art history and art who go there, but you also have tourists. Um, and you have so many different layers of, of visitors and expectations. So, and part of all of that is managing their own history. They are a Manhattan institution. I mean, they are the Manhattan institution. Mm -hmm. So um, moving in the way that you suggest, I think, I, as it is, changing galleries in this way, um, they were all preparing for anger and you know, upset and traumatic reactions from um, very devout, devoted fans. So I imagine if they actually you know, moved the building, that would, uh, that wouldn't go down well. <laughs> okay, Dale Burning Sawa, thank you so much for joining us today. <music> Turkey's art world is a predominantly male industry, but one refuge has been the Turkish National Technical Institute. It's been a place where women, especially those from poorer socioeconomic backgrounds, could get their start. Well, showcases Nursan Atutar attended an exhibition there to see how through education and hard work, female artists here in Turkey are trying to get ahead. It was two decades after the establishment of the Turkish Republic that an institute was born. Despite the nation's battles and ongoing challenges, one remarkable woman founded the Turkish National Technical Institute in 1945. It was aimed at empowering young girls and women with skills like various arts and crafts so they could build a career and earn wages. Offshoots of the school spread throughout Turkey, providing teaching but also employment. Many students came from poor families. Through apprenticeship, Thousands sewed, knitted, painted and crocheted items to wear, while a range of home decor and art also emerged. It wasn't long before these women started getting commissions from royalties and celebrities all over the world. This is not about fashion or art, not really. This is all about empowering women and giving them choice. For decades, this institute has been providing women with artistic and technical education so that women can decide how to thread the life they want for themselves. Fast forward to today, the institute is celebrating how far their alumni have come with an exhibition in Istanbul. I love how Turkish women have always been brave and found a way to raise their voices to tell their side of the story. Back in the day, even living in a patriarchal society, a young woman would put a pepper-shaped pin on her scarf to express her frustration over an argument she had with her mother-in-law. Everyone knew what that pin meant, and she wore her statement on her head valiantly. 
So the institutes are trying to tap into that courage to find new ways to express ourselves. And we're going to do that by being ourselves, not trying to imitate the mainstream trends in the Western world. They also declared a manifesto with 10 articles, with the emphasis on the importance of representing the unique motives each region has. The Minister of Education and the First Lady of Turkey attended the opening, and both talked about how people all around the globe are bored of seeing multiple copies of the same thing everywhere, and how much more valuable a unique piece can be. These works, done by the Technical Institute students, are like endemic plants that can only exist in one specific geographical region. The motives and the art behind them are special to our lands and they represent both the past and the future of our culture. Soon enough, we'll be hearing that the alumni of the Institute are working at an international scale all around the world. We are training qualified and experienced young people who can offer a fresh perspective to the human resource needed in the sector. The mission of the Technical Institutes is to revive the cultural values and become ambassadors of region-specific heritage. The works on display are a mixture of old and new productions. Although they're quite different from one another in quite a number of ways, they all have one thing in common. They're the voices of women's resilience and creativity. Nur Sanatutaj, TRT World, Istanbul. At the turn of the 20th century, Avni Lifij was one of the most acclaimed painters in Turkey. But when he died at 41, his work receded into the shadows. That is until now. Lefij's family and the government has turned over his paintings to the Sakab Sabancı Museum in Istanbul. And it's not just an exhibition, but a celebration in paying one man his artistic dues. Early 20th century Turkish painter Amni Lefij's short life journey as an artist officially began in 1906, when Istanbul State Art and Sculpture Museum director Osman Hamdi Bey saw his acclaimed autoportrait with pipe. Between 1909 and 1912, Lifij was sent by Hamdi Bey to Paris to participate in the global art scene. Upon his return to his homeland as a seasoned craftsman, Lifij became an art teacher and also gained recognition as a member of the 1914 generation of Ottoman artists, named after the year the Great War broke out. From Istanbul, Lifij then made the effort to contribute to and participate in art events around the world. He contributed 18 of his works to the 1918 Vienna War Paintings Exhibition. He stood out from his peers due to his realistic approach, in which Lifij depicted both his environment and the subjects that grabbed his attention, and for keeping a poetic aesthetic, despite this realism. Lifij passed away due to a heart problem at the age of 41 in 1927 leaving most of his works not in galleries, but in the hands of his painter wife, Harika. And now, the legacy of Lifij is being resuscitated by the Sakup Sabancı Museum, almost where in a grand-scale retrospective, 1,000 pieces of his works ranging from paintings and sketches to his writings and photography are being shown. Lifij is a figure who stands out from his generation. He questions himself and his environment. As a man of the world, he keeps in touch with fellow artists abroad and is up to date with the art fairs held in world capitals. In his works, Lifij aims to capture the age he lives in. His wonder in his surroundings is evident in these paintings. He does have a global view on things, but is actually connected to his local values. A documentarian at heart, Lifij is honest and meticulous in his depictions of sceneries and people. To both richness and poorness, his stance is an equal one. His friendships with people also have this quality. He's known for being there for loved ones who are forgotten by the public after losing positions in government cycles. 
This quality is also another reason why his short life deeply touches people. But despite being an artist with such a unique vision and character, why did Lifij remain a mystery to the modern art world until now? Avni Lifij passed away in 1927, and his documentations and writings are either in Ottoman Turkish or French. Most of his works are small-scale art pieces, and 90% of these were preserved by his family. His wife chose to live the life of a recluse in an apartment in Nishantashi after his untimely death. For almost 50 years, she lived with these art pieces. Then the family needed to sell certain pieces, and these works found their way into the art circle. But the last exhibition of Lifij was 20 years ago. If you're not in exhibitions or auctions, you're forgotten in this field. Lifij's bigger scale works were commissioned by the state, so they were in the archives. Here, a wide variety of his works are present. We have been working on this event for two years. We delved deep into the vaults and archives as best as we could. The people who come to this exhibition are really lucky in that sense. From now on, Lifij's aesthetic will be embossed in society's consciousness. You cannot talk about art in Turkey without mentioning his name. And the hard work has paid off. The touching paintings of Avni Lifij, whose work was inspired by a strong moral of conduct, is now amazing art lovers in this grand-scale retrospective which will be on display until the 15th of January, 2020. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of arts and culture. To start off, what you're looking at is a painting that fetched $22 million last week during a Christie's auction. Parc de Prens shows a football match created by French abstract artist Nicolas Destal. The piece was only displayed a few times before going under the hammer, earning his estate a record amount for one of his pieces. The Bosphorus Film Festival returns. 83 movies from 25 countries are being screened here in Istanbul. This year's incarnation includes a retrospective on South Korean director Kim ki duk Movie buffs can check out the films until October the 25th. And Robbie Williams returns after a three-year hiatus with his first Christmas album. It'll feature singers like Brian Adams and Rod Stewart, and for some odd reason, the British professional boxer Tyson Ferry. Vampires have haunted the silver screen since the dawn of moving pictures. Now, an exhibition at the French Cinematheque is resurrecting the undead. From the Count to Buffy, just in time for Halloween. The French Cinematheque is following the footsteps of the bloodsuckers on the big screen in a new exhibition. Vampires, from Dracula to Buffy, chronicles the iconic presence of this fictional creature since it first emerged in cinema. Here you can find the objects used in Werner Herzog's Nosferatu remake. And the crimson red robe is worn by Gary Oldman in Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 film, Dracula. What we have tried to show in this exhibition is vampires have been around as long as cinema. If you track the vampire as a theme from as far back as 1910, you will see a story of cinema unfolding. Inspired by Greek and Mesopotamian mythologies, the vampire myth thrived in the Middle Ages and took its final shape at the end of the 19th century in Bram Stoker's book, Dracula. Around the same time in Europe, the Lumiere brothers were exposing their first films to the public in Paris. But the journey of vampires on the big screen starts with the 1922 German expressionist film Nosferatu. Initially, the vampire is the other, the animal, the enemy, the one who frightens with his fangs and teeth. But by the end of the film, the vampire becomes nicer and may even appeal to the beastiness. Neither dead nor alive and always marginal, the vampire wonders who he is. 
leading filmmakers and the viewers to ask the same question. And perhaps that's why the world is still obsessed with it. The early 20th century was a time in Paris for artists from all around the world to meet, collaborate, fall in love and produce art. For Salvador Dali, the first painter he met was René Magritte. And nearly a century later, the Royal Museums of Fine Arts in Brussels explores the often overlooked artistic relationship between the two great surrealist masters. It was a bromance that lasted only one summer. René Magritte and Salvador Dali met in Paris. They fell in love with surrealism and spent one memorable holiday obsessing over it in the romantic seaside town of Caracas. But soon after, the passion faded and the two artists grew further and further apart. That is until today. The Brussels Museum of Fine Art has just launched the biggest ever exhibition dedicated to Dali and Magritte. It's a celebration of the artistic relationship that existed between the two greatest icons of the 20th century surrealist movement. For the first time, they're on show together through a monographic exhibit of this kind. The goal is not to show that one influenced the other, that one taught some things to the other. It's rather to tell the story of a flirt, the flirt between two people who we don't expect to like each other. Dali and Magritte met in 1929 in Paris, home to the surrealist artists of the 1920s and the birthplace of the surrealist manifesto, written by poet André Breton. In short, the intellectual movement was aimed at freeing the human mind from the chains of rational thinking. In the art world, this translated into dreamlike artworks like that of Dali and Magritte's. Theirs and the work of their contemporaries unlocked the imagination and gave way to fantasy, challenging our perception of the world around us. But not long after their visit to Dali's house in Spain, the two artists started drifting apart. They had very different personalities and they disagreed on their approaches to money and fame. It was a short-lived friendship but from it was born something of an artistic symbiosis. Like, for example, the objects that catch fire. It's something that Dali borrows. And at the same time, there's a distance between them because the two men have totally different personalities. There's a withdrawn side to Magritte. Dali has a Baroque personality. He plays somehow with madness. So they're not friends, but their works show there was mutual respect between them. And however outlandish and even deranged some of their artworks appear, to this day they are referenced in from global fashion houses and advertising campaigns to video games and virtual reality. Surrealism today continues to have a large influence on the general public because the movement aims to show how the brain, how the thought process really works. Without imposing limits to this exploration, it opens the door to the subconscious and our most avowed or unavowed desires. And perhaps it is not only Dali and Magritte's artistic dialogue that rendered them so jointly unique, but also they shared talent for remaining contemporary, relevant and relatable. And so, despite their bromance blooming too early, their work will never go out of fashion. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. Now, before we go, a tribute to Turkish author Nuri Pakdil. He passed away last week, but leaves a literary legacy that includes more than 40 books and dozens of awards. Thanks for watching us. Bye for now.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الفاتحة أنا روح 